tech is driving the future of our workforce. The World Economic Forum predicts that 50% of all employees would have to be retrained by the year 2025 to keep up with the advancements of technology. Are our schools adequately preparing our students for their future? In South Africa, there are one million students that approximately start school in grade one, and only 23,000 of them matriculate with a maths mark of over 60%. That's a conversion rate of 0.23%. To put that into perspective, that's that bottom part of that milkshake, that last part of the sip you're too embarrassed to take because of the noise it's gonna make. Let me tell you about the time I thought I was gonna revolutionize education. Throughout my undergraduate years, I tutored hundreds of students. I loved every moment of it. And looking back, it was some of the most exciting times and got me through my electrical years. Working with most students was extremely interesting. Although they came from unique and diverse backgrounds, one thing united them together, trauma in mathematics. The excuses were always the same. My teacher hates me. No matter how hard I try, I just don't have a maths brain or the good old, this was never taught in class. So when I had the opportunity to become a high school maths teacher, boy, was I ready to be the greatest teacher there could ever be. I was exuberant, animated, I recorded all my maths videos, added it with some trap music, I played FIFA with the kids during break, and even provided free extra maths classes. And after two grueling terms, my class finished with an average of 46%. And sadly, that didn't improve for their finals either. One specific science class where there was a student that stared blankly outside the class and stared into the trees. Let's, for the sake of the talk, call her Ada. I was surprised, but also very impressed. I've never seen a student engage more with the concept of photosynthesis. So after class, I called Ada up and had a brief chat with her. And it was sad to hear that it Ada was completely exhausted. It takes Ada more than two hours to get to school using public transport. She comes from a dysfunctional family where her parents are constantly fighting, which results in her having to take care of her younger sister. And at that was a pivotal moment of my teaching career. It dawned on me, why would Ada care about photosynthesis or chlorophyll or trigonometry? Why would any of our students care about the abstract theory that's being taught in class when the pathway to achieve their dreams is vague and daunting at best? And some of the traditional fields, like to become a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, is no longer captivating our students, who are more excited about the opportunity to become the next TikTok sensation or the social media influencers. Let's think about it. Is there anything instantly gratifying about our education system? Our modern teenager requires an updated approach to their curriculum that is on par with the modern world that they live in. With the recent advancements in technology, new subjects such as robotics and coding have exploded into the classrooms. The aim of robotics and coding is not to make perfect engineers and computer scientists who by the age of eight have the remarkable skills to work with electrical circuits and program, but it's an opportunity to build their critical thinking and problem-solving skills. As we enter into the age of automation, there's an inherent fear that robots are going to take over our jobs. And what are we doing about it? We can teach our students skills that machines inherently don't have. That is creativity and entrepreneurship. Create a way for their future where self-driving cars and trips to space are no longer confined to fantasy cartoons. So here's a question. How do we reform education, but more importantly, prepare our teachers to harness the power of technology and prepare the students for the digital age? Their digital age. Did you know that there are over, there are over 25,000 innovation hubs in South Africa? Sadly, most of it call us schools. And that's where we started. We started a company that helps schools introduce robotics and coding into their curriculum. Most teachers have a universal desire to see their students do well. Speaking with most teachers, they're enthusiastic about the new tech fields. They want to learn and teach these new kids to students, but sadly are underprepared and overwhelmed. We knew that for us to succeed in this space, it had to go beyond just dropping off some exciting robots at schools. We had to design a solution that revolved around our teachers because teaching should be a walk in the park, just not the Jurassic Park. 
When it came to our students, it wasn't just as easy as slapping together a bunch of online content. Did you know that less than 5% of adults who purchase online courses go on to complete them? These are adults who are purchasing courses to further upskill themselves in their industry. What chances do our students have? We had to make sure that our content was engaging. We worked hard with our academic experts and our engineers to create content that is technologically advanced, but also pedagogically aligned. Our content had to be progressive and scale all the way from grade one to grade 12. And at present, our programs are being implemented in over 150 schools with over 50,000 students using our program. This year, we had the opportunity to host our first robotics expo. The theme of the expo was space and how to build and survive in a colony such as Mars. As I was walking around, I sat with one of the groups and had the most riveting conversation with a girl called Ketlejo, who, by the way, was eight years old. Their team's task was to gather the excavated rocks on Mars and transport it back to base camp. So I asked her, so Ketlejo, what are we doing today? So I have to take these marbles, space rocks, to ride over there and make sure that the marbles don't fall off. So I'm going to start off by building a base around my robot to ensure that the marbles are in place. OK? Then I'm going to go onto the software, and I'm going to grab the right and the left motor blocks, and I'm going to turn them on so that the car can go straight. Then I'm going to stop the right motor, but keep the left motor turning so that the car can turn. Are you following me, sir? I'm like, yes, I'm right with you. <laughs> this was the moment I handed Katleko her certificate. Me and her are best friends right now. And it was at this moment I wondered, what was I doing when I was eight years old? I was trying to convince my parents on why I should go play cricket outside when my report card stated otherwise. You know, social programming. Same, same, but different. I've always been intrigued by the concept of a smart city. Not so far in the near future, all our cars will be self-driving. We will have an underground refuse system where garbage will be transported using pneumatic tubes, We'll have robotic cops with facial recognition that can detect any suspicious behavior and 3D printed cost effective houses. And really reaching here, but a future with uninterrupted electricity. <laughs> now let's take a moment and think about how our school experience was. It would have started with us probably going to morning assembly. You're in science class, it's a double period, and you're learning about plant and living systems. You're wondering why this period is taking as long as the rate at which plants grow. You go over to technology and you're learning about the strength of materials in isometric drawings. You're wishing for that strength on you to get to break. And universally, break has always been about two minutes long. You get to IT, you learn about the Microsoft suite before going to business and economics where you learn about world banks and journal entries. And before you know it, in the 30 degree scorching heat, it's time for My Dear Othello, with none other than Shakespeare. What would a smart school look like? Imagine you get to go to school, and the theme for the year is sustainable farming. You and your group have decided to build a smart garden, a garden that self-waters itself when the soil is dry. But now you're in science. You're excited. You care about the warmth of the air, the light. You even engage with your teacher to find out more about the different types of plants and the ecosystems they come from, because the last thing you want to do is overwater your plants. You move over to technology, you use the strength in materials, and you design a, a perfect frame that can control your irrigation system or that can hold your irrigation system. You go over to break, and before you know it, you're back at IT. You have an awesome opportunity to build an app, an app that controls and monitors all the vitals of your plant. You can see how often the plant is being watered. You can see the water levels in the tank. You can see the moisture level in the soil. And for those entrepreneurs, they even in introduce a camera so that you can monitor your plant and control it virtually. And now you go to business and economics, something for all our entrepreneurs. This is an opportunity to take your product to market. You come up with a go-to-market strategy. Am I going to sell this directly to customers, or is this going to be a B2B solution where I sell it to farms? You come up with a model, you research your competitors, and you even look up supply chain and logistics. And before you know it, it's Shakespeare time. But this time, it's Hamlet. To AI or not to AI? That should be the question. 
We are not so far away from this. Most of our schools implementing our program are creating amazing projects, such as automated hand sanitizer that detects your hand and releases a little bit of soap. Our students are creating home automation system, introducing them to the concepts of IoT. Automated garages, solar panels, temperature sensors, security systems around the house. An autonomous line following car that uses infrared sensors to detect and follow a black line. Today, it's an autonomous line following car, but tomorrow they could be working on the Mars rover. I would like you to meet Cable. That's his actual name and not his tech pseudonym. I first met him when I was pitching at a school to try to get them to implement our robotics and coding program. I approached the teacher, and the teacher was very sweet, but said, I'm a biology teacher, and I'm in charge of running this club. I'm learning with the kids. Speak to Cable, and if he's interested, we'll pilot your program. So there I was, getting ready to pitch to a teacher, or a principal, or any adult, really, but I have to pitch to a 15-year-old. So I got into some cool clothes, profusely watched some TikTok videos, and approached Cable. Cable was remarkable and had some of the highest levels of ADHD I've ever seen. I went on to share our robotics and coding program and about our Python programs. He was so excited and he shared some of his stories of his past experiences with Python. With Cable's blessing, we got to implement our robotics and coding programs and the kids loved every moment of it. A few years later, I contacted Cable and he told me he got 43% for mathematics and matric and he had no idea what he was going to do next year with his life. So we offered him an internship. Cable started with client support, built some of our products, and now two years later, Cable works at our company. He is our junior software developer that builds mobile and web applications. He's currently working on a software IDE that most of our schools are using to control their robots. So I wonder what would have happened to Cable if he did, the school didn't offer a robotics and coding program. I wonder what would have happened to him if we didn't offer him that internship. I didn't have to wonder too long, I just walked up to his desk and I asked him. And he said, I would have probably taken a gap year, redid some of my matric subjects, done a degree I didn't like, and probably become a college dropout. And it was at that moment I was thought of Ada. I wondered what Ada is doing in life right now. I wonder if she ever had an opportunity to show her genius. Sadly, this is the reality that millions of our students are facing. We place more emphasis on the natural resources in our ground than the millions of students that are waiting to shine in our classrooms. Millions of diamonds who are waiting to shine. To sum up, there's a multitude of social problems that our schools and students face. Robotics and coding can be a great hope for the future. It can connect the dots between abstract theory and practical applications and bring back relevancy to the education system. And with these skills, we can teach our kids to be good digital citizens and go and leave a long-lasting impact in their communities. I'm excited about the education reformation that's taking place. Join me as we rewire education one code at a time. Thank you.